This is a spring, an elastic object used to store mechanical energy. It oscillates back and forth on a period into and out of equilibrium. Let's pause at this point in its motion and analyze the forces acting upon it. The first force is a downward force, or force due to gravity, denoted by F sub G. Or Mg, the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, in this case 9.8 meters per second squared. The force opposing Mg is the normal force, or the force of the plank on the block. The force to the right is the pulling force, pulling the spring and object out of equilibrium to the right. This is denoted as F. The force to the left is the force of the spring, acting against the pulling force. This is denoted as F sub S. The final force is the force due to friction. It points to the left because of the direction of motion. Now let's pause again as the spring and object return to equilibrium. Remember the force diagram from before? Well, only some of the forces will change. First, since the direction of motion is now to the left, the magnitude of the pulling force is smaller than F sub S. Also, the friction force changes direction, but not magnitude, because the block now moves to the left. Meanwhile, the normal force and the force due to gravity stay the same. This is a block attached to a compression spring. Again, we're going to analyze the forces acting on the block at this point in its motion. The normal and gravitational forces are the same as in the previous example. The force of the spring, F sub S, is now pointing to the right. The pushing force is pointing to the left, and the friction due to the block's motion is pointing to the right. Here is the same block moving towards equilibrium. The forces stay relatively the same, however the magnitude of the pushing force decreases, and the force of the spring increases. The frictional force changes directions, but has the same magnitude due to the change in the direction of motion. All of these forces and free body diagrams can be confusing. Luckily, math is there to make sense of it all. The force of a spring can be found by using Hooke's law, or the equation F sub S is equal to negative Kx, where K is the spring constant, multiplied by x, the distance the spring is pulled or pushed out of equilibrium. The energy contained in a spring is also extremely useful. The potential energy stored in a spring, u sub s, can be found by 1 half kx squared. This potential energy, once released, turns into kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of an object passing through the spring's equilibrium can be set equal to the potential energy like so. This means that the potential energy of a spring is equal to 1 half times the mass of the object times the velocity squared, and furthermore, 1 half kx squared is equal to 1 half mv squared. These six springs oscillating next to one another show the sinusoidal oscillatory motion present in springs. This is a rough sketch of a sine curve over the springs. Knowing that springs exhibit a sinusoidal oscillation, let's now examine the period of a spring and how it is influenced by different variables. First, the spring is pulled out of equilibrium by 3 centimeters. Next, the spring is pulled out of equilibrium by 5 centimeters and released. The difference between the first and second trials is nothing. The period didn't change. This is because the distance a spring is pulled out of equilibrium doesn't affect the period. As shown by the equation, t is equal to 2 pi times the square root of m over k. This is due to a greater returning force the farther the spring is pulled out of equilibrium. The mass, however, does affect the period of a spring. Shown here is a spring pulled with the mass of three weights. Take note of its short period. Now with a mass of 5 weights, the spring exhibits a much longer period, 